All right, children over 30, we got a lot of shit to cover today, so let's get right to it. So first I just wanna again thank um, Leon, again for hooking me up with the Wizard setup, the Intuition Liner, the Seba SX boot, and the Wizard and R100 frame. Um, of course, I've already posted reviews of all of that stuff. All of that stuff, you know, I think it's safe to say I wouldn't have got a chance to try out if it wasn't for him. And uh, so for him to really to give me that opportunity and you know, even seek out my opinions about some of the things is, is pretty dope. And on that note, I do also have to thank Joey McGarry because Joey's the one that found um, my videos first. Joey's the one that showed them to Leon. Before that, Joey's always been like super cool about uh, anytime I had a question about something or something like that, he always, you know, got back to me. It's a really great dudes, all of them, you know, and uh, I'm glad that they seem to have liked the input that I've had so far. I was a little bit nervous about the, the wizard frame one. I have a tendency to like make a criticism of something and then come at that criticism from a bunch of different angles and I was worried that it made the whole thing, you know, come off too negative, which isn't really what I wanted. I mean, I think it's a very awesome frame for a certain application. It's just that, you know, I think a lot of people misinterpret what that application is because all of the quote unquote swivelly bop tricks are done on them. Um, people think that they're like the number one frame for doing that kind of thing, which isn't really the case. You know, again, they're uh, better for doing that than a standard frame, but they're really about like the park skiing aspect. Supposedly, I would dig the NR90 better, which uh, I find likely because it's actually uh, wheelbase and rocker wise pretty close to a setup that I'm already running. It's a little bit more stable in both of those, uh, but it is a lot faster than that setup. So, Anyway, so what we're doing here today is we're talking about a frame designed for flow skating. So if you've established that the wizard frame isn't necessarily the best for my interpretation of what that is, you know, what would be, how do we look at that, etc., etc., etc. So the first thing to do would be, I guess, to define my interpretation of what flow skating is. I'm not sure I would guess that Leon's personal interpretation has a lot more influence from that like a uh, park skiing thing that I mentioned before like you know flowing from transition to transition bank to bank uh, quarter to quarter what have you but for me um, it it's always been more about that that heavy dose of like flat land skating it's in my mind when I picture the ideal like um, a sample run would be like you hit like an alley-oop top sole on something and then you come off fakie and do like a fakie 360 swivel and then gazelle out of that which gets you back to forward and then you kind of hit the mohawk so you can get into like a med spin kind of position and then like you hit the med spin with like a hand plant over like a fucking bench and then you know do a swivel out of that and then jump up and like do a grind and essentially just like a long ass line. The style of skating where it's kind of difficult to define like where one line ends and another one begins, you know, it all just kind of flows together in this big fucking awesome line, the awesomeness. The first couple design ideas that I have uh, to serve more like the, the grinder blading side of things, because I know I'm probably gonna like lose a lot of people after that, but um, I do think that this frame that would be perfect for this style of skating probably wouldn't exceed 80 millimeters and really you can zip around the city fast enough and you know like 72s 76s you know i mean they're both like pretty quick and second the big limiting factor for rocker you know which obviously you need a rocker for this kind of thing is like wheelbase as it relates to rocker size so if you have a really long wheelbase with a little rocker, like you're not gonna be able to feel that little rocker at all. Whereas if you take that same rocker and you put it on a small frame, like you would be able to feel it. And the challenge with that is there are certain really parts of the foot that you want more stability in, and then also just certain applications that you want more stability in. So the ideal rocker for doing footwork, for example, will put you on your ass like if you're trying to go down a ramp in it. Like, uh, it's a it's a different ball game. So I think the solution is gonna come in the form of suspension. And I don't mean suspension across like all 
uh, for wheels because uh, if anything that would be like a giant detriment to uh, footwork and stuff like that because you know your wheel height would just to adjust to whatever your foot was doing so you wouldn't ever be able to get a smaller wheel base or like a pivot point or anything ever but if we had let's say millimeter and a half rocker on the front and back and then suspension on those wheels only well then you know when you lean back you know to get like that rocker position or lean forward to get that rocker position because your weight is on that wheel like it's gonna it's gonna make the rocker a little bit more drastic you know and we only need maybe a half millimeter to a millimeter of travel to make that a really viable and usable thing and I would go so far as to say you could probably do it with different wheel hardnesses. So for example, if you had like 84s on the outside and then like some 88s in the middle or something like that. But I also think that there would be very easy ways to make that into a frame. Um, I know that pretty much everybody that's done a suspension frame so far has, you know, put a patent on it and everything, which, you know, they should. Good for them. But there are so many ways to design a suspension frame that haven't even been touched on that are like easier than what's being produced right now. I mean, like if you just made a little fucking gasket that went around the axle on both sides that under 200 pounds of pressure, let's say compressed one millimeter, like that'd be it. That's literally all you have to do. You could also make frame spacers just out of a slightly softer material, you know, and of course the part that touched the bearing would still have to be metal, but like if the whole rest of it was some sort of uh, slightly squishy, I mean, realistically a pretty hard rubber, but something more squishy than steel, um, then you would achieve your goal. So none of the companies that have those patents are doing that to my knowledge. And there's two ideas that you can use and there's, I mean, they would both theoretically work. For grinds, and I do, I think grinds are a big part of this style. I think it would be silly to approach this style and not approach grinds because, you know, I mean, switch ups are basically footwork. Like, it just fits the aesthetic quality of everything else that's in the style. I mean, you're essentially doing footwork on the ground or you're doing footwork on an object. So, I'm a pretty big fan of the way that uh, Kaiser did that on the arrow. Um, I think those walls are probably. A quarter inch thick, uh, maybe thicker. They do have a little lip that goes over the aluminum part of the frame, and then they have a bevel that goes upward, so that reduces like the you know grinding area, obviously. And also, just by virtue of being like wider on the bottom, it's going to protect your bolts for a little bit longer. So I don't know if the walls are interchangeable on those, but they should be if they're not. So I hope whatever the next frame is, they are replaceable. For this type of thing, getting frames that are exactly the right size for your exact foot are going to be a huge deal. Um, when we're talking about wheelbases and balance points and you know all that type of stuff, like that is so so crucial and dependent on how big your foot actually is. A 243 millimeter frame feels totally different to me than it does to somebody that's like a seven and a half and totally different than somebody that's like a 13. And even like within then, I mean, I would say my experience is probably remarkably different than somebody that's like an 11, 11 and a half. And in other skating disciplines where footwork is, uh, you know, a primary concern, such as, you know, figure skating, they really, I mean, I think there's like three sizes per like inch up increments usually. Maybe two more in the upper sizes, but man, they really like go up with the size of the foot because they have to. So on the surface, this seems like a really uh, prohibitive thing for anybody trying to make a frame for this sort of deal. But there are ways around it, specifically because we have inline skates. There are things we've already figured out that we can do. For example, those Solomon rockers. So the Solomon rockers are about uh, a centimeter, it's somewhere between eight millimeters and a centimeter left and right. And to do this successfully and get like max bang for the buck, you may have to like include two sets of frame spacers with the frame, which is not a big deal because you can just figure them into the cost. And about every five millimeters, which is a half size in skates, just have a rocker position that you can use, you know, so you have one centimeter rocker back and forth and then you have another rocker that's, you know, the five millimeters in between is the center point. And that's it. And then you can make 
a frame for a seven, seven and a half, eight, and another one for an eight and a half, nine, nine and a half, and another one for a 10, 10 and a half, 11. Yeah, and you're, and you're pretty much done. All right, now we're gonna get into some extra, extra blade nerdy shit and just kind of look at how rockers and wheelbases work together and really what that means. All right, so excuse the shitty MS paint, whatever. I'm not an artist. I didn't claim to be an artist. You know what the fuck I'm talking about. Anyway, so I wanted to see how rocker and wheelbase would relate to one another in sort of an empirical way. Like just be able to analyze and compare, you know, how different setups would feel without spending like a whole bunch of money on actually figuring that out. So basically what we're talking about here is uh, what's called similar triangles. And basically this opposite wheel that's the farthest from the, you know, the one that you're on, uh, how high or low that is, is going to have a drastic effect on how swivelly you're going to be and how stable you feel in that position. And the wheelbase distance, like from here to here, for example, is going to have a big effect on how swivelly it is. So the equation that you use, you have the rocker, say you put two millimeters, a millimeter and a half, whatever here, first to second wheel distance, just measure from the inside of one axle to the other. This is what you're solving for. The total wheelbase is from here to here. And when you do that, yeah, you just cross multiply the shit and solve for X. So now let's look at uh, this big ass chart where I figured some stuff out. So I used three different frame sizes, um, 250 millimeters, 275 and 300 for 72s and 80 millimeter wheels, even spaced. Again, the wheels are even spaced, distributed throughout that 250, 275, whatever. Close is like as close as you can get them together. So, um, you know, for a 72, 73 millimeters is gonna be the closest you can get them together without them rubbing together or going into like fractional millimeters, which I'm not gonna do. And, um, yeah, far apart is like uh, basically the opposite of an H block. Like if your middle wheels were pushed to the center and then your outside wheels were pushed out as far as they could go. And then we have the tri wheel here. Again, X, if you remember back the last thing we looked at, that was the distance between your opposite wheel and the ground. So when you're up on your toes, how high is your heel off the ground? Um, so the bigger that is going to be a more volatile feeling. So, I mean, the data kind of follows that you have your foot's the lowest with like, you know, a one millimeter rocker and it's the highest with a two millimeter rocker, just like you would expect. So really what we have to do this is we have to take it and relate it back to the wheelbase. So, you know, with the size of the wheelbase given, which is going to be a factor in how swivelly it is, and then how high our foot is arched off the ground, which is also going to be a factor in how swivelly it is. We have to kind of like tie those things together which is what this little red thing is down here. We have to demonstrate how X and the wheelbase interact by relating X and the wheelbase. So there's a couple ways that you can do this. You can either take these numbers and multiply them together, or you can take them and divide them. I chose to divide them just because it lets me work with smaller numbers, um, but your result is gonna be the same either way. I used the word flotient because I thought it was clever, like the quotient of flow. So a smaller number is more volatile. And here you can just kind of see like how stable or unstable each thing would be. So um, two millimeter rocker, uh, 250 millimeter frame, 80s even. This is about your slalom setup right here. It's very far like on the bottom side of the scale. There's not a lot of things that are less stable than this. Then towards the upper end of the scale, you have all the tri-wheel shit. The deal with this is just that, you know, with three giant ass wheels, the Wheelbase is just so fucking huge that you're not going to be swiveling. You're just not. So try wheel, in my opinion, I mean, if you want to use it to go fast uh, down a trail or something, like that's your prerogative. But for like what I'm talking about, like flow stuff, try wheel is absolutely off the table. So based on my experience, uh, which has been 85A-ish wheels on a size 10 boot, remember I mentioned earlier that your experience with this is highly dependent on how big your foot is. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are ones that I've generally found to be in the acceptable range of things that you can at least somewhat comfortably do tricks on and somewhat comfortably skate on for that matter. Um, so all of these, you're still going to be able to go down ramps and you're still going to have all your dance moves and stuff. Some of this is a little bit misleading though. So 
this 275 with the two millimeter rocker. That's essentially my Solomon setup right now or my Solomon frame setup. And because it has a big 90 millimeter wheelbase in the middle, it's pretty stable. You know, I never feel at a lack of stability, you know, when I'm centered on it. The, the weird thing about it, and I think why it ranks so low on this is just that, you know, with a frame length that long, when you get into that front rocker position or that back rocker position, like it just feels super fucking awkward because it's actually like beyond the balance points on your feet. So, you know, for me to try to maintain that front like two wheel position or the two back wheel position is actually quite difficult, even though the normal skating experience is, uh, you know, overall pretty steady. And with the with the wizard, it was um, kind of the same deal. The wizard would probably be the front rocker was just over a millimeter and the back one was just under. So what the fuck can we do with this information? So I think it's important to point out that none of these by nature are totally unusable except all the tri-wheel shit really i guess anything above like the upper limit the 28 or whatever i said it was i wouldn't use anything above a 28 but you know a lot of these smaller numbers like 13s and 11s and 10s i think it's a pretty well established fact that human beings pivot on the balls of their feet so I think it would be highly advisable to have one super unsteady position that you could get to fairly easily or stay off of fairly easily, but nonetheless, one super unstable position that you could use to just, you know, swivel like a motherfucker. Like, it's an important tool. It comes back to that whole thing mentioned in the last video about how if, you know, you're going to take away the H block, you have to replace it with something. And I think that, you know, a rocker is a good start, but giving yourself a rocker plus a wheelbase plus, you know, some foot alignment that allows you to spin in place like 6,000 fucking rotations should you so choose would be what's seen as like an acceptable replacement. You know, I can't do front sides, but my footwork is magic. You know, it's not like anything you've ever seen before, bro. So kind of backtracking a little bit, after I first made that table and figured everything out, this is kind of what I figured out for myself as what would be my ideal frame. So I took the smallest wheelbase with the wheel size that I could tolerate that I could, 73 up front, then I had a 90 in the middle, and then I checked it out for like a 117 in the back. I was really trying to get some of that figure skate flavor where, you know, they're always landing fakie just like we're always landing fakie, but they do that shit on one foot. And a lot of the reason they can do that is because they have a blade that sticks out way past the back of their fucking foot. And I think based on this, I was going to use uh, either a two millimeter rocker or one and a half. I can't remember exactly what I decided on. And the idea for the placement was that uh, this is like the end of my toe, for example. This was the ball of my foot, this was the bone above the arch, and then this was a little bit out past the heel. So all in all, this would like perfectly line up with all of the major points of the foot. So based on that, I got these Solomon frames again and Frankensteined some 72 millimeter wheels in the middle and 68 millimeter wheels on the outside. So two millimeter rocker, 90 millimeter wheelbase all across. So obviously the, the back of this didn't end up coming out as far as I had originally hoped it would. The center wheelbase I think was right on, but the front one again was too wide. And you can see on this rocker, I have it rockered in. This one I can't rocker out because the UFS bolt is oh, yeah, right there. Again, I have been figure skating and shit lately. The uh, rocker on those, which is where you do all your spins and shit, is basically under like the ball of your foot, more so like the bone between like the last joint of your big toe. It's like straight under there, which this is still quite forward of that. So. And realistically, riding them around, I could see this coming back a little bit. I don't find myself losing balance in the front really as much because I tend to slalom a lot and push through my heels. And really, uh, really like most of the time when I'm skating, I'm pushing through my heels or like the middle part of my foot. I'm never like coming off the toe ever. But I fall, uh, you know, backwards trying to land fakie all the time. And this one, while originally I thought it was a little bit too short, it ended up being a little bit too long. Um, this one's at a weird point. It's like, if I rocker it in, 
it's too short and I'm slip sliding all over the place and I can't get like a stable bass. If I rock it out, uh, it's a little bit too much and it starts dragging. So, you know, again, that just shows you that like five millimeter difference on wheel placement is a big fucking deal when you're talking about getting the perfect match of swivel and stable. That goes oddly well together. And I just thought of that swivel and stable. Anyway, overall, I like this setup quite a bit. It's still not what I would consider the replacement of the H-Block though, in that, uh, you know, I think it's very openly, and it's been proven to be very openly debatable on, you know, how many tricks are you giving up versus like how many are you getting. And with good reason. I mean, the, the canon of big wheel tricks is growing all the time, you know, and I mean, obviously we borrow from figure skating, we borrow from aggressive skating, we borrow from slalom, and but people love their slides, man. Uh, so you have to like, you know, show definite things that like, no, you can't do this with a slidey frame. And this isn't one of those frames that I can say, you know, objectively, like if I had some GC bigs or something, I couldn't do all the tricks that I could on this. I like doing them more on this, but that's not saying that I couldn't. So I spent some time kind of musing on that and thinking about, you know, what I had learned and that, you know, you really wanted like a good pivot spot, like on my figure skates under the, you know, last joint of your big toe. But then, you know, it's still important to have something in front of that because if you do slip past that point, like if your frames just stopped there, like a bunch of people would fall like on their face constantly. Like you have to have a little oh shit thing there. You know, the problem with trying to get on your second wheel, your third wheel uh, on skates is that a two millimeter rocker is like fucking nothing. So if you think about trying to balance on that perfectly, like you're allowing yourself one millimeter distance on the wheels on either side and you have to maintain that perfectly or you're gonna either stop or roll away or I mean, not what you intended to do more or less. So it's just silly to think that we could do anything complicated on the second or third wheel, which we really need to do to, again, ex expand our canon in a way that's going to be beneficial to the style and the pursuit, the, the, whatever you want to call it. And then the problem with like the, the first and fourth wheel on frames is that they're just so far out that they're really hard to balance on. I mean, obviously there's like pro level slalom skaters that make it look relatively easy. But then I would say at least 50% of the time they look pretty sketch doing it too. Like it's just not a good position to be in. Even if you get that J-turn leg around and stuff like that, you know, that helps with the balance a little bit and it looks doper. But, uh, you know, to say that they look completely in control for the duration of the trick, uh, I think would be an, an overstatement. So if we can't get a perfect four wheel setup and tri wheel is just out of the question. Really the only way that we can look is to like a five wheel setup. I've heard Joey and I think Leon talk about doing a five wheel before, but I like the idea and it's kind of difficult to um, argue objectively because there's not really, I mean, there's not a five wheel frame out there that you can just go and check out. And even if there was, you know, I mean, there are so many, how do you even like set up a five wheel frame? Like, do you even space them and then like do like a V kind of rocker? I mean, that, that wouldn't be a good idea because then you would have again, the, pivot point like right in the arch of your foot which is not where you want it at all. You don't really need like an extra wheel sticking out back. I mean we, we really have no problems getting enough room out the back with a four wheel setup anyway. So it'd be silly to add another wheel just for that. In the front, let's talk about that. So this is the um, pick skates frame. Yeah, I don't remember the uh, the model of it. And it's not technically a five wheel frame, even though it looks like it has a little Annie rocker in the front. It's really soft Annie rocker. If anybody ever has a purpose for sticky Annie rockers, I guess you can get them from this company. Anyway, there's a screw right there that's in there to make sure it doesn't move. What this actually is, is a toe stop. So let me talk about what a toe stop does and then kind of briefly touch on why that would be possibly superior to just having another wheel in the front. And by the way, let me just mention on the stop front, I'm really as apprehensive as anybody to get into this territory. I mean, certainly it's gonna make skating up certain non-traditional transitions a little bit different. And the idea of having something that resembles a break anywhere in your skates is absurd. But 
Uh, I think now that I understand really like the utility of them, like what they're for, like what the toe pick on figure skates does, I think it would be silly not to use them. Um, again, if we come back to the swivelly bop, like these open doors for swivels and bops. Again, here we got the pick frame on the music stand. One of the main things that you see figure skaters do that you don't see inline skaters do is uh, like spin around on one foot for like ever. Uh, and I thought originally that they would just like go like into the toe pick like this, like hammer it down into the ice and then pivot atop that. That's not really actually what's happening. What happens is they go up onto, think of this first wheel as like the rocker on an ice skate and then the pick is the toe pick obviously. And you just kind of float in that middle position and carve like backwards circles and your circles just get really small at a certain point and that's when you start going fast. You know, you bring your body in and it's super tight. I've been working on it and I love it, man. It's awesome. The other thing that you can do with these is toe jumps. So the advantage to these is that it allows you to get rotation before you leave the ground and also it gives you an extra appendage, let's say, to spring off of. So you end up getting higher and you spin faster, which is why, you know, it's not uncommon for figure skaters to do triple toe loops, which is essentially uh, a fakie 1080 that lands on one foot. And the idea is you're just skating along fakie, you know, and then you have this foot behind you, and then you plant down on the toe pick, you don't slam it down, this isn't like a fucking like muscle yourself off the ground technique. You put it down right here, and as your legs come together, there's a sort of like scissor and compression, and then explode off, and that helps you get the extra height. The spin, because you're on this little point right here, you can actually start the spin, like I said, before you even leave the ground. A lot of the times on the toe loops that I've been working on, I'll make it like maybe close to 180 before I even leave the ground, you know, which makes landing a fakie 360 really pretty easy. And you know, at this point, a lot of people are going to be like, well, that's cheating, whatever, it's not, it's whatever. Are H-blocks cheating because they help you do groove tricks? Are soul plates cheating because they help you do soul tricks? You expand the hardware in a way that makes the maneuvers you want to do easier so that you can do more complex things with them. Like there's a reason why a fakie 360 isn't an acceptable thing to do on figure skates because it's fucking easy. Just like you can't do a fakie 360 down a five set on rollerblades and get featured in anything, but on a skateboard, like that's pretty legit. So yeah, I think we need to make cheater frames. And I think that they're gonna resemble this quite a bit. Shit, if you made a five wheel frame and then just drilled a hole in it, there are a few obvious issues with this frame as stock though. Um, the wheelbase on this is extremely short. It's just enough to fit 72 millimeter wheels and four 72 millimeter wheels, which I think puts it at like 220 millimeter or something like that, like tiny, tiny wheelbase. And this fucking rocker is probably like two and a half millimeters, maybe even getting closer to three. Like it's a huge fucking rocker which is, I bet, why they come with like ADA wheels to kind of squish down and mellow that out a little bit. I think on an ideal frame, at least for my size, you could probably space out the wheelbase to at least fit 76s and probably knock it down to either a two millimeter rocker or like a one and a half, probably one and a half and just count on the user to sort of swivel in the rest as they need. Also, the rocker on this toe pick is about a whole centimeter more than it is on the wheel in front of it. So all in all, if you're perfectly balanced on this front wheel, you have about six millimeters height between this wheel and the ground and that pick and the ground, which again is great for swivels and stuff. This enables a situation where you can get up onto one wheel comfortably. Uh, I mean, you just really have to imagine how good you can swivel on just one wheel, like it's insane. and. You know, the balance is so much easier to maintain that I'll put a link down in the description, but there's a dude um, using these and he's a figure skater, you know, and his movements sort of reflect that, you know, they're not the very masculine movements that we normally associate with, you know, aggressive inline skating or, but the moves are all there, dude. He's doing fakie sevens, you know, on flat ground. He's spinning like a motherfucker in one spot. You know, his footwork is awesome. Like if you just cover up the top part of his body and watch his feet, it's like uh, one of the dopest wizard edits you've ever seen. So that's what I wanna do. I wanna make a frame that I can grind with, that I can swivel with, that I can go down ramps with, 
And right now, um, you know, it's going to take me a little bit to get a working setup of these going so I can really offer feedback. And maybe, maybe close to summer, I can try to make a frame or something like that. But I'm going to try to stick these on some fucking Solomon boots and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll let you guys know. This concludes the uh, wizard special, Wismus, Wismus in February. Check back periodically as I post new videos. I don't really do like a weekly thing or anything like that. If I have content to put out, I'll put it out. Thanks again to Leon, Joey. Thanks to Pick Skates for the next part of my journey. And uh, see you guys soon.